if you consider yourself an A player and then you hire a bunch of C players, your job's going to be hard. You know, I'm going to go hire as many A players as I can and create a winning culture and a winning team. Uh, you've talked a little bit about tr- so, you've talked a little bit about trust today, um, and I'm I'm curious from an entrepreneur perspective and people that have been in your chair before. Are you guys? Do you consider yourself like a control freak? When you bet the farm on your company, you invest all the money, you you get the loans, you you do all the things, you make all the promises. As an entrepreneur, you feel like you have all of it on your shoulders, right? And so, to some degree. Yeah, you want to trust other people, you have to trust other people, but you also have all the weight on your shoulders. You're like, I have to make this thing work. And there might be parts of the business you're like, I'm not going to give this thing up because I feel like I have to control this thing for us to be successful because I bet everything on it. You know what I mean? So be- and that but it's a double edged sword because you might be your own worst enemy because right. you're like, you're in the way. You are actually the problem yeah. because you won't delegate. And we're back for another episode of the Startup Puzzle. This is your host today, Matt Watson. Today, very excited to be joined by Greg Schmetting. It's been known for a few years. He's actually the chief sales officer at Full Scale, and he worked with me at Stackify. Today, we're going to be talking about key hires, when to make key hires. Like Greg was a key hire at Full Scale, so we're going to be talking about when do you make those big hires and things to think about. So before we get started, I do want to remind you today's episode is brought to you by FullScale, which is my company. We have over 300 software developers in the Philippines doing all sorts of front-end, back-end, mobile, QA, whatever you need help with, you can check us out at FullScale.io. Greg, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Matt. I'm glad that you consider me a key hire. It's good to know. (laughs) Well... You know, you've been a key hire a couple times at my companies, um, both on the sales side. Um, right. You know, I guess why don't you give us like the real quick, you know, your background um, from a sales perspective and, you know, your career real quick. Absolutely. Um, I would consider myself a bit of an old staffing dog, you know, all, all my life, all my career, straight out of college, I've been in the staffing industry. Um, always IT staffing. I've sat probably in every major seat uh, within the staffing world. I've been a recruiter. I've been a salesperson. I've been, um, I've sold solutions. Um, I've been a branch manager. I've been a regional manager. I've been a senior vice president. I've been a COO. And, uh, you know, for, for a couple of times with you, uh, specifically focus on sales, you know, uh, VP of sales, sales, chief sales officer. And so, um, that's, that's the world I live in. That's the lens I look at things through is, uh, how can we drive more business within the staffing industry, more butts in seats, so to speak, if you, if you want to say it like that. Um, and a lot of times, uh, I don't necessarily consider myself like a hardcore sales guy. Um, I consider myself a hardcore staffing guy uh, that knows how to execute this business from a sales perspective, the very, very best. Um, And a lot of times I look at it not so much from uh, again, hardcore sales, but it's about solving problems. You know, it's about solving problems for our customers. It's about solving problems for our consultants that we want to try to find great opportunities for. And it's about solving problems, I think, for ourselves and how we can become more efficient at all of those things. And so you a lot of times talk to me about sales and you call me a chief sales officer. And uh, sometimes I'm a little uncomfortable with that because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a problem solver, I feel like. Well, I think as entrepreneurs and and business owners, business leaders, like that is that is the job, right? Like we should all be problem solvers, and especially if they're problems for our customers. Mm-hmm. And it, specifically today, I want to talk about a problem that a lot of entrepreneurs have, which is making these key hires, right? So, at at any company, as the company grows, you get to a point where I need a Greg or I need somebody, whatever it is. And it changes dramatically, right? Somebody's probably listening right now and they're like, oh, I have this business idea, but I don't have a business partner or I don't have a co-founder. Like it starts there. Like the co-founder is almost the key hire, right? right. And Or it could be like, we don't have 
a CTO. We don't have somebody to help build this thing. Um, so every company at every stage, you know, has a key hire and even full scales company that's several years old to 300 employees. We still have key hires. So, you know, when I had a conversation today about needing to hire a like head of operations and head of HR and, and like different, different roles that we still have. And as the company continues to grow, there will be yet other key hires. Like it's, it's a never ending problem for every company. Absolutely. And you could probably answer this question. Maybe I'll ask you a question is like when it's, when you're an entrepreneur or when you're in a startup, that founder or those first two or three people uh, inside that organization have to wear many, many hats, right? Uh, you as a founder, you wouldn't consider yourself a sales guy, but you're always selling, right? And so um, there comes a point when you can't wear every single hat. You got to give that hat over to somebody else and let them take the ball and run with it. And that's one of the things I, I think I appreciate about you and working with you and for you is that you're in the trenches. Uh, you're, you're, you're more than willing to sell when it's time to sell. Uh, you're more than willing to, you do the marketing stuff amazingly, right? But you're also willing to say, Hey, Greg, you've got the sales ball. Go run with it. Uh, go create the processes, go do the right things and go take us to the next level. And so, um, I do think though that it's important. Early on, um, I think in some of these smaller, uh, more startup uh, situations that those key hires can't come too soon. And I think the, 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 the thing that's perfect for me and full scale and where we are right now is that there's some foundation already there. Then that foundation is not bad. Um, I don't know that I would be the perfect from scratch guy uh, for you. But I think I'm a really good, hey, the foundation is kind of there. There might be some cracks in it. It might be a little uh, off uh, off level from in places, but go and help us um, fix that foundation and then build from, from there. And uh, I think that's important. And you would probably know better than I would. Doing that way too early would be a mistake, especially with a guy like me. Well, you bring up a, a bunch of different topics that I want to talk about. And I think one of the, the most important one starts with, as a founder, you have to wear a lot of hats, right? Like, especially when you start out, you can't afford to pay a VP of sales, a VP of engineering, a VP of operations, or, you know, every one of these people want to make $200,000 a year, $300,000 a year, whatever. I can't, you can't afford to pay all these people, right? So you have to figure out how to wear all these hats. You have to figure out how to do all these things. And then as you go, one of the other traps is, let's say early on, you hire a salesperson, right? But the problem is you don't want to make them the VP of sales because they're probably not qualified to be the VP of sales or the chief sales officer. Right. But inevitably, a lot of startups, that's what happens, right? Like the first software developer you hire, you're like, you're the chief technology officer. It's like, oh my God, why did you do this? So like, this guy has no, no experience. We'll never grow with the company. We'll never be the CTO or the VP of sales or whatever it was that you just gave the job title to it is another trap, right? And then the, I think the even harder part for a lot of entrepreneurs, and I see this a lot um, with previous business partners, with friends, people on the show, is the delegating part, right? Like when, when am I willing to hire somebody and delegate this to somebody else? Um, a good friend of mine has this problem today. Like they just don't trust other people. And they, if they would just hire like a couple really key people and then step back and do what they're really good at, the company would probably like triple in size, but they won't delegate. And I'm curious, Greg, if you, have you had to drop into any companies and you can throw me under the bus <laughs> where, you know, you get hired and they bring you in but then they won't delegate all the stuff to you and you end up kind of fighting, you know, the, the business owner. Honestly, Matt, I don't know that I've experienced that. Um, and maybe I've just been lucky to where I'm fighting the business owner or I'm not being allowed to do my job, but it's certainly a conversation that I've had with multiple friends of mine. And most of my friends are in the staffing industry, right? Uh, but multiple friends of mine that are, that are trying to do good work. They're trying to, 
uh, do the job that they were brought in to do. And then uh, ownership is, is holding them back or they're trying to make a decision and that decision is being questioned. And um, they're saying, well, why'd you bring me in if you're not going to let me do these things? And so I think I've been, I guess, fortunate enough in the, in the handful of organizations that I've been in, I haven't really experienced that too much. Um, and I certainly haven't, I guess, experienced that with you. You let me do my thing. And uh, so that's good. In, in fact, hey, I was happy. You, I was. You almost let me do my thing too much because every once in a while, and I've learned this by deal, working with you, is sometimes I'll just be th- thinking about an idea. I'll be thinking things through. I'll be talking it out, and I'll ex- express it into the universe. And then two seconds later, you're running with it. A day later, I'm like, wait a minute, I wasn't ready to do that yet. So I've had to learn when I'm dealing with you, like, be careful what you say, because 24 or 48 hours that later, that thing might be real. And so uh, uh, you almost let me do too much. Well, I think I think that's the key, though, right, is if you're going to make a key hire, be it a head of sales, a CTO, whatever, whatever that person is, is you've got to hire somebody you trust. If you do not trust this person, yeah. you cannot have them in this position, right? And I, I've been in this situation a couple times where I've had either a director or a VP or whatever it is that is working for me that eventually you also lose trust in that person, yeah. right? And you're like, that is also the moment where like this person has got to go. Right. You know, if you're going to hire somebody that is going to be in a leadership position, you have to trust them unequivocally at what they do. And you really should be hiring somebody that is better than you at whatever the thing is, right? Like I hired you because like you're the expert at sales and IT staffing, right? Where, for example, if I was hiring a a CTO or maybe even a head of marketing at full scale, that might be a really freaking hard job, right? Because that is my background and my experience. And so I'm more likely to want to drive the strategy and be involved and maybe micromanage who the person is, you know, what the person's doing and all this. Like if I was going to hire somebody to do that, it had to be somebody, and this is my point, that I unequivocally trust. Like if I'm going to hire somebody to do marketing or a CTO or a CTO for me, it better be somebody that's really, really good and I really, really trust that I can hand the ball over to and step away. But I think that's one of the hard things as entrepreneurs. You have to figure out like what are you really good at what are you really interested in? And if you're going to hire somebody specifically to do that, those things, that is even harder because that, if that is your expertise and your specialty, it's harder to give those, those things up. It's harder to give up that trust, especially if you think it's something that's part of the like secret sauce of the company or why the company is going to be successful is because you work on those things. You know what I mean, Greg? Well, it isn't that the key to, to, to everything and, 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 is surrounding yourself with people that are better than you at, at things. I mean, that, that, and, and it takes a level of ego that you got to get your ego out of the way. And, and, you know, I would think that eventually here at full scale, uh, you're going to ask me to go out and hire a team or maybe even an army of salespeople. And when I go, when I go hire those people, I'm going to go look for people that I think either are better than me right now at selling and have great networks yeah. and have done this job a whole bunch or that have the potential to be, you know, better than me, you know, after they've been doing it for a while. Uh, Cause I want my job to be really, really easy. If you surround, if you're, an, if you consider yourself an A player and then you hire a bunch of C players, your job's going to be hard. You know, I'm going to go hire as many A players as I can and create a winning culture and a winning team. Uh, you've talked a little bit about trust. So, you've talked a little bit about trust today. Um, and I'm, I'm curious from an entrepreneur perspective and people that have been in your chair before, are you guys, do you consider yourself like a control freak? You know, when you bet the farm on your company, you invest all the money, you, you get the loans, you, you do all the things, you make all the promises as an entrepreneur, you feel like you have all of it on your shoulders. Right. right? And so to some degree, yeah, you want to trust other people, you have to trust other people, but you also have all the weight on your shoulders. You're like, I have to make this thing work. And there might be parts of the business, you're like, I'm not going to give this thing up because 
I feel like I have to control this thing for us to be successful because I bet everything on it. You know what I mean? So, and that, but it's a double edged sword because you might be your own worst enemy because you're like, you're in the way. You are actually the problem because you won't delegate. It's that whole idea that you're able to get it to one level, but you're not able to get it to the next level. So you need help around you to do that. Um, But when you talk about making key hires, Matt, um, isn't that part of what you just said there? Isn't that why it's important to maybe not do it too soon and to make sure that there's a little bit of a foundation in place to grow from? Uh, Because if you make that hire too soon, there's just, it's just, it's not the right time or it's not the right person or it's not the right way to bring on those really, really key hires uh, inside of us. Um, a newer organization. So let's talk about that for a minute. So at Stackify, we hired, which was, which were pre- previous company of mine that I had from like 2012 to 2021. So we hired a head of sales, a guy named Jim, really nice guy, very early on, like within like 12 months or something of the company started. Cause I thought like, Hey, we built this product. We're going to figure out how to sell this thing. Jim had experience selling enterprise IT software, kind of like you, like, you know, he seemed like the right guy and all that kind of stuff. But we just weren't ready to sell it. Like our product was not ready. We did not really have product market fit. And so I hired Jim, who probably made like 200 grand a year, 250 grand a year, whatever it was. And we weren't really selling anything. Like we hired him too soon. And there was no other team. It was just him. And that, that was a hard, that was a hard lesson, partly because we just hired him too soon. And there was no supporting cast, as you said. Yeah. And then I also at one point in time, hired a guy uh, named Max as our chief marketing officer. And he was super brilliant. The problem with Max is I bring him in. And he's like, where's my marketing team to help me do this stuff? And I'm like, dude, you are the marketing team. You're the CMO, you do everything. And he's like, uh, no, I need a team to help do this and this and this and this. He's like, you know, I do strategy. I do leadership, right? Like I, I help figure out the big picture and big ideas, but I need people to go implement them. Like people that are experts in, you know, different pieces of marketing. And I'm the guy, you know, that figures out the big stuff. And again, hired him too soon. Didn't have the supporting staff. Didn't, didn't have the supporting cast. And it was ultimately a big mistake, and he just ended up not being the right guy. Brilliant guy, but not in our situation. So that conversation kind of makes me think about a few different things in my past. Um, you know, you, you get into certain organizations and you kind of do those uh, almost like those personality exams where they tell you, hey, this is what you're good at. This is what you're not good at. You're, uh, uh, you're analytical or you're not analytical or you're, or you're creative. You know, and, and one of the things and I've been through one of those, I can't even remember what it was called, but uh, at the end of it, it was like, hey, you get things done with and through people. And so that's always stuck with me a lot. It's like, yeah, I need a team around me. Um, you know, if you had said, hey, I want you to come in here and, and be a doer only, they probably wouldn't have been a great fit for me. That's not what I'm looking to do. Um, I like to lead and grow and be a part of teams. And so. Um, it, it kind of makes me think about too, um, you know, I've been a part of really, really big companies, like global companies. I've been uh, involved in small companies and my skills and abilities and what I'm able to do, they're the same in both situations, but how I uh, utilize them are different. And so like in a big company uh, or just a strength that I think I have is that I can, I can kind of parachute myself into a situation uh, maybe into an office or in a branch or a team or whatever. And I can pretty quickly kind of figure out what the strengths and weaknesses are. Hey, what are some gaps? My spidey senses tell me there's something a little bit off over here. We need to fill in that gap, that sort of thing, especially within the, you know, staffing, staff augmentation world. I, I, my, sure. my spidey senses are pretty good. Um, well, my that was harder at Stackify, right? Right, that yeah. was a lot harder had, at Stackify had, because it wasn't staffing. I had zero spidey senses at Stackify, so I'll admit that. <laughs> so, but in a small company, I can do those same things. I can go in and I can I can see gaps. Um, I can I can see uh, where things need to be fixed. All that good stuff. The difference is in a big company, um, you know, I can I can I can do all of that. 
I can uh, get some consensus around that problem. I can take that consensus of that group of people, create a small team, and then put a plan in place to fix that. Well, in a really, really small company, um, that's really, really hard. You know, I'm the one that that identifies the identifies the problem. I'm the one that creates the solution. I'm the one that implements the solution, and I'm the one that yeah. manages it. Yeah. And so, I think for for me, what's been a really, really good fit for me uh, at full scale is we're kind of uh, we're kind of in the middle. You know, I can go and do all those things, but we have enough. Um, we, we just have enough people. We have enough uh, of a foundation around us that I can go put those little small teams together and put a plan together. And it's not all on me. If that makes sense. It's not so big. It's not so big that the whole machine is already there, right? There's like, no. it's not a team of 50 salespeople that is a sort of well-oiled machine and you just fit in and go do your role. It's a small, it's a small enough team that you can come in and, and you can make a big influence and make changes and, and, and help the team win. Right. Absolutely. And I think here at full scale, uh, what we've done probably in, in, you know, we've just been here or I've just been here a few months, uh, and, and the term that I've used with you quite a bit is just like quarter turns. Hey, we've got all of these little things right. going on. Um, We've got these things that we're doing pretty well, but if we give it a quarter turn, we could be doing it really well. And then we can stack those things on top of each other and we can get great uh, momentum and uh, achieve great things. And I think just in the little bit of time that, that I've been here and I've been here with you, um, I do think we see that momentum uh, picking up and it has a lot to do with those little quarter turns that we're all making across the entire organization to, to make us better. Um, and you know, some of the efforts that you're doing inside of just marketing and the way you you attack marketing, uh, from a staff augmentation perspective is super unique. Um, I've never really seen some of the stuff, um, in action, the way that you do it and the way we're doing it. And it's, um, super fun to be around, really exciting. And, uh, every day I, I'm like, oh man, I saw Matt do this little tweak. Something happened. And all of a sudden, we've got three new leads that we can act upon. It's super fun, you know. Well, I think I think you bring you talk a lot about what's really important with making a key hire and, and the key hire being successful, right? Like if I was going to hire a a CTO, a VP of engineering, a VP of operations, a VP of customer success, whatever it is, I sh hopefully can bring them in, and immediately they can survey the field and figure out, okay. Here's where we're, here's where our strengths are. Here's our weaknesses. Here's our opportunities, right? Here, here's the problems we have. It's like, oh, we actually have these really amazing customer success te team that we didn't realize how good they really are, but I can help mentor and coach them to the next level. Or, or you come in, you're like, no, these people are awful and we're going to have to upgrade the talent, right? Like, but the thing is, like, if you're that key hire, they need to be able to do that. It shouldn't be like, well, I just hired my buddy who, you know, has worked in sales for a year. And now he's head of sales and bring him in, right? Like you want to, the point is like, you want to bring somebody who comes with a playbook. That, that was the thing. I think, I think Craig Farrell and us always talked about, like when you're hiring somebody like this, they better come with a playbook. Like that's part of the yeah. reason you hired them as a key hire and then just promote a salesperson that you already have to be head of sales. I hired you, Greg, because you had the playbook. You knew how to do this. You had done this for 25 years. So right. when you come in, plug you in, I'm bringing the playbook. Come in, run the show. How do we do this thing? Where are all the quarter turns? Let's go make the quarter turns and let's go win, right? Like that that was the key to me was the playbook. Well, I don't think my playbook's very fancy, but I think it's effective. And, and I know how to run it. <laughs> uh, so I'll admit that. Uh, you, you bring something up too. And, and, I, and I can think it back. You know, over the years, because I've interviewed a lot of people and I've hired a lot of people into uh, higher level roles, middle management roles, leadership roles. It might be at the branch level or whatever uh, in different organizations. So I've, I've interviewed a lot of people. And the one thing that always frustrated me the most was when somebody would sit, be sitting across from me and I was interviewing them. And uh, they might have, you know, 10 or 15 years of experience in the industry. And I would try to get them into a conversation where they were architect or they were articulating their philosophy on the business and, and all, and they couldn't give me anything. 
And I'd be like, you got to You've got to have some sort of a belief. You've got to have some sort of a opinion about what the right way to do this business is. And if they were just, you know, a pile of mush that knew how to do the business, but didn't have an opinion on the right philosophy and the right uh, strategy, uh, it, it just, it just, I'm like, how can you, how can you do this job for 15 years and not um, be able to articulate that to me? And I, I never hired those people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so part of the challenge when you are an early stage company, you don't have a big budget, right? Like, like as we talked, you can't spend two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year to hire some VP that worked at this big company that has all the experience, has all the network, has all the playbook, right? You can't afford to do it. So we were really lucky at Stackify hire two or three people that were more say at a director level that we had to almost make a bet on. And a great example of this was uh, Megan that worked for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was actually when we first hired her, uh, she was, I think, a, a um, teacher at a IT school and we brought her in and, and had her doing customer success for us. And then eventually she was doing director of customer success and then, eventually VP of customer success. But the point is like, you almost have to find people that are kind of on the cusp of it. You're like, you know what, I think this person could be a really good director VP. And I'm gonna have to make a bet on them a little bit to kind of help grow them. But I'm maybe I can hire them for say, $100,000 a year, instead of the VP with the experience and the playbook that comes in for 200,000 plus a year, right? Like that, that's part of the other struggle as a, as a founder is you you have to figure out where do I make those bets? You're like, well, maybe I could, you know, hire this person and they'll be good enough and they'll be okay. Versus other places, you're like, no, I need like the expert help. Even if I have to pay, you know, big money for this role, I've got to pay big money for this role. Does that make sense, Greg? Absolutely. And I think that super important. And that's a play that's been run since the beginning of time is being able to look out, uh, find, find, attract, talk to, recruit, um, that person that might be in an organization that's like one level below um, what right. you're trying to hire into, and they're not getting that opportunity. Uh, they're right. being held back. Somebody's not seeing them. And you got to be able to, can you recognize greatness in that person? Or if, hey, if I can, I recognize something that somebody else doesn't recognize, I can uh, I can breathe new life into that person. I can grow that person. Let's give them a chance. I'll bet on them and they're going to win for me. Whereas somebody else isn't giving them that chance. So I think that's a play that's been run since the beginning of the time. And, and it, but it's just hard to recognize. You got to be good at recognizing that. And it's a skill. And it's super hard if you're an entrepreneur, you know, founder and you're like, Hey, I don't have anybody that works for me in marketing how do I even hire a director of marketing or a VP of marketing? How do I hire somebody I can trust to do this? Like that's its own hard problem, right? Especially when you're like, I got to hire like four or five people across all these different disciplines. Yeah. yeah, It's hard. It's just hard to even interview them and figure out, are they, are they going to be good at the job? How many of the hires that you've made inside your organizations have been like within your personal network or based on referrals or how often have you maybe used an outside agency or how long, how many times have you made, posted a position and, and, and waited for people to come back to you? I, I'm guessing that much of your success has been based on your personal network or referrals. You know, as I think back over time, I don't think I ever did like executive recruiting at Stackify, like to hire somebody like you. I didn't use like in a high level, like executive recruiter for that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think I ever have in my career, actually. I've only used recruiters for hiring like a software developer. Yeah. Um, not really like executive leadership positions. Yeah. Well, it, I think too, you know, when you if you want to take the conversation back to a little bit about making key hires and when to do that. And I think about the situation that maybe we're in at full scale right now and what we're trying to get to six months from now, a year from now, three years from now, whatever the case may be. Um, I think if you try to scale up, especially on the sales side and go and, and hire a small team to a small army of people without having um, a strategy in place, um, 
the right um, processes in place, the right vocabulary in place, the right culture in place. You have to, you, you, if, if you can look into the future and say, I need to hire 10 people uh, to create this team. And if I did it under the current situation that we're in right now, it would be a disaster. You got to hire, you got to hire somebody to help you get there. Yeah. So, well, I think one of the most important things as a entrepreneur is understanding kind of your role. If you're more of the operations person or you're more of the visionary big picture CEO type type of person. And there's a, a great book called Rocket Fuel. I forget who who wrote the book that's about this. It's about the relationship between the CEO and the chief operating officer. And actually, it was Craig Farrell that recommended that I read this book. And I don't read books. But when Craig came to me one day, he's like, Matt, you need to read this book. I was like, oh, man, what did I do wrong? Why do I need to read this book? Um, but it was kind of a eye opener for me because as an entrepreneur, you know, like you said earlier, you come to me and you give me an idea and the next day I'm like, Hey, let's do it. Let's go do this idea. Let's go, let's go, let's go. That doesn't work well in most companies, right? Like, um, you can't constantly have like a new idea every day and doing this and doing that. Like it's too chaotic. Now, for an early stage company, it's a little bit of a superpower, right? Because like you can move quickly and you, f- you figure out what works and, and whatever, but it can also be very disastrous, right? Especially if if you just kind of have ADHD and you're all over the place and yeah. and you're like, Greg, I, yesterday I told you to do this. Why aren't we doing this? But now Greg, do that instead. Forget what I told you yesterday. Yeah, I know we haven't had enough time for that to be successful. Don't care. Yeah. Doing something else, right? Like you can't be all over the place. And one of the things that Craig, you know, really talk to me about was like, you know, Matt, you come up with the ideas, I'm your sounding board. You know, part of the reason you hired me as a key hire as the chief operating officer is to be that sounding board. Let's work through what the ideas are. So instead of you running to everybody in the company with all these ideas every day, walking around the office, let's talk about it, bounce them off idea, bounce them off of me, and then I can help execute the good ones, right? right? And I can be the buffer between the rest of the company. So I really recommend that that book, Rocket Fuel. And if somebody who's listening, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm that guy. I'm the person that has all the <laughs> ideas. I'm driving everybody crazy. I really recommend that. Like you need like that, you know, second person, that right-hand man that is the chief operating officer. Um, that is somebody that's more tried and true, steady, yeah. you know, running the race, more operational, you're kind of crazy all over the place, which is great. That's a superpower as an entrepreneur, but you need to partner with somebody that can kind of anchor you down a little bit and go execute those plays. I think there's there's another book out there that's very similar to that. I think it's called Second in Command that talks about a lot of the stuff that you just talked about there. And one of the things that, you know, we're talking a little bit about Craig right now, which is interesting. I'll talk about Craig all day. Love that guy. Um, but uh, I always liked when he talked about the rule of 90. You know, and and he he kind of taught me the rule of ninety, and it, it was different. It's ninety seconds, ninety minutes, ninety hours, but at the end of it is 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 ninety days, and it's about how important it is to when you're when you're instituting a new initiative, when you're trying a new uh, strategy, when you're trying a new play to run a new play, um, you know that it needs to have time to to live and breathe, and ninety days is a good rule of thumb uh, because that's how long it takes to um, create a habit, you know? And, uh, and so I'm kind of, and, and I came to you today. It's funny that we're talking about that. I came to you today. And I'm like, Hey, we're getting close to the end of my 90 days here. And I'm starting to think about the things that we need to be doing next. And so I think uh, that rule of 90 is always a good one to think about. So tell us a little more about your last 90 days. So we, we hired you as a key hire. You started the first week of January, 2024 at full scale. You're the chief sales officer. You you know, you have an IT staffing background, but what we do at Full Scale is a little different with offshore development, staff augmentation. A little different, not a lot different, a little different. But I'm curious, like what what have been like the 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 you know, the ups and the downs of that? Like you get dropped in, you're like, hey, you're in charge of sales, go. <laughs> um whew. I, I think for one, it's been more ups than downs. Um, it's been really, really fun, uh, the last 90 days. I think we've seen a lot of success. 
Uh, one of the things about um, full scale and the offshore business that we do compared to the more traditional US based staffing that I've done historically is I would say that there's a lot more similarities than differences in the business. I think the, the absolute biggest difference is just the location of the resources, you know, where we have 300 resources in the Philippines. Um, you know, it's been a lot of fun for me. Uh, one of the differences that I think has been is that um, um, the business moves lightning fast uh, compared to U.S. based kind of onshore staffing. So that's that pace of the business and the operating business. Uh, uh, um, the, the operating rhythm of the business has been uh, really, really fun. But, you know, for me, um, you know, I kind of always kind of try to try to break it down to like three different things and really take it easy, slow down, you know, gr you know, learn, ask a lot of questions, talk to a lot of people, absorb what I can. But as quickly as I can, I'm going to try to create process. Hey, what's our process? What's our standard operating procedure? What is it that we can make repeatable around here that we can do over and over and over again? And I think part of that is also creating a vocabulary. I'm always kind of surprised at how many places that I come into that don't have like uh, a uniform vocabulary about how we're doing business. So try to speak to the business exactly the same way over and over and over again. And then the last one, which is the hardest one, is just create culture. You know, create a sales culture, create a culture of winning, create a culture of account breakers. Um, you know, culture is a word that's used um, a lot and it's hard to define and it's hard to build, but just at least try to uh, have an eye on that sort of thing and, and, and what's our culture and how we're going to create that. What's, what are we like within the sales team? So I think hopefully you've seen me do those things, uh, as far as my time here of, of really working on, working on our process, defining our process, defining our vocabulary, and then creating a, a culture. How do you think, have there been any instances where things haven't quite went the way you wanted them to go or thought they would go, or you didn't get the support you needed or things have been a challenge? Like, I think have there been any negatives in the last 90 days or it's all been rainbows and unicorns and sunshine? <laughs> it's been mostly rainbows and unicorns. It really has. It, I'm having a blast. And you, I think you see that from me every single day. Um, I think just trying to kind of, uh, especially when we're dealing with the offshore stuff, um, it's my first time. Uh, dealing with uh, the time change and maybe the cultural difference um, the, and just being able to, Hey, how, what's the operating rhythm of communicating? Is it via Slack or, or whatever the case may be uh, very obviously very virtual. Um, but just trying to figure out how do I fit into that? How do I, how do I uh, turn the ship maybe over there Um slowly without being a bull in a china closet and being very mindful and respectful of of um, the fact that they don't know me the way you know me and that um you know i, I want to do the job really really well so i think i think maybe that's been the hardest part for me to maybe get my arms around is just the offshore component and, and how i fit in and how i have the most positive impact like like um you know i'm working with the sales team here I can have a positive impact every single day. If I feel like I'm not, I'll pick up the phone and try to have a positive impact. But how do I do that from a thousand miles away is, has been harder than I suspected. Well, I re really appreciate having you do this today, Greg, um, talking about key hires. And I, I think we covered a lot of, a lot of great topics about key hires. I, I wrote a blog uh, on my blog. So my blog's at visionaryCTO.com. For those who are listening, you don't subscribe to my blog. I wrote a blog one day called, titled Why I Could Never Be a VP of Engineering. And I think one of my key takeaways is being honest about what you're good at, what you're no, not good at, what you don't, what you want to do, what you don't want to do, what you what you want to delegate. And I wrote this blog post about why I could never be a VP of engineering, because like I just don't really enjoy managing people or process. I'm more of a strategy, big picture, innovative kind of person, like managing people and process is just not really my thing, which means I really need a good VP of engineering that would do that. Like, but I think the key is like realizing what you're good at, what you're not good at, I think is super critical, I think is my 
key takeaway for for this uh, today. And Greg, do you have any final thoughts, any final words of wisdom? Um, my final words for of wisdom. Well, you caught me off guard with that one. Um, I would say the thing that um, I try to stay focused on from time to time and remind myself about when doing this business or any business and trying to build a successful teams is really the idea of not always just focusing on the end result. Uh, and I think that can, that can happen a lot as we, we focus on the end result. We often uh, celebrate uh, the wins. Um, we focus on the losses, um, but we don't always necessarily focus on how we got there and the little things it takes to get to those wins or those losses. Um, the idea of uh, focusing on the root, not just the fruit, and making sure that your root is strong, that you water that root, um, that you make it strong. And if you if you do that, the fruit will be there. But if you just focus on the fruit and don't tend to the root, that your your fruit will wither and die. And so celebrating those small wins along the way, uh, creating a process that can ultimately win to, uh, lead to those wins, uh, I think is super important. And I think people forget about that. And I think it can happen in small companies as well because those wins are so, so freaking important, right? And so um, I think, uh, you know, taking a step back and saying, how did we get that win and how can we repeat that? And, um, you know, what was the steps along the way that that we should also celebrate those little things along the way? I, I think that's what I would maybe uh, um, leave as my last thought with you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Greg. Again, today's episode is brought to you by uh, Full Scale, which is our company. If you need help growing your development team, front end, back end, all the programming languages, all of it, check us out at fullscale.io. Greg, thank you so much for doing this today. Thanks, Matt.